Well, I remember going into a shop on Neville Street, and it may still be there. I'm, I'm not a big uh, antique shopper. I enjoy it, but I went in there. I think I was looking for something specific, and I came across some things that a gentleman had made. He had he'd taken, I guess they're sculptures of a sort. He had taken... Parts of old engines, bolts, worn out brake rotors, uh, old rusty car springs, and worthless pieces of metal. Stuff that is of no value anymore. And he had put it together into a sculpture, into something unique, and according to this shop, apparently quite valuable. Um, the, the price tag on these things was, was not small. He gave value to those pieces of scrap iron by the way he assembled them. And today what we're going to see is that God takes the broken, used up things in your life and mine and he puts them together in such a way that it is for our good. Giving value to even the broken things in our lives. This is the confession of Romans 8.28. A, a very common verse. One, uh, one pastor that I listened to said, He has heard more people say, That's my favorite verse. That God works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. He says, more, maybe more than any other verse, that's their favorite go-to verse. And you might be able to recite it. That's good. We are to hide God's word in our heart. But here's the thing. You might be able to recite it. But do you believe it? And when things are going good, when they're going well, yeah, absolutely I believe it. God's working everything for my good. But what about when things fall apart? Do we still believe Romans 8, 28? So what I want to do this morning as we work through this verse, verses 28, 29, and 30 over the next coming weeks... Um, there, there are, one of the Puritans said that this is, um, he calls it a cordial, a healing medicine. This verse is a cordial to the soul, and I would not be doing what I need to do if we don't hunker down for a bit and find encouragement here for our souls, medicine for our souls. So, let's Look at why we struggle to believe these verses when things are difficult. Let's read together Romans 8, 28, 29, and 30. Romans 8, 28, 29, and 30 says this. This is God's word. We know that God works all things together for the good of those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. As we look at this, I want to make sure we don't misunderstand the confession that Paul is making here. I think what we want it to say is, my God is making even the bad things in my life Good, in, good for me right now. That's what we want it to say. That if something bad happens, oh, he's going to take that, and right now he's bringing something good. 
I don't think that's what Paul was confessing. But what he was confessing was something much more than that. So let's, let's take a look. Let's pray, ask the Lord to help our hearts to receive this, and then we'll jump in. Father God, thank you for this, this balm, this salve, Lord, that you put on our wounded hearts, this cordial of the soul. Father, I, I recognize that even this morning there are many uh, sitting at home, listening, watching. There are many even in this parking lot whose hearts are heavy and hurting and discouraged and questioning. Father, my prayer this morning is that your word would hit its mark and that, that you would in our unbelief, Lord, help us to believe. Father, I pray that we wouldn't leave here without a right understanding of this confession from Paul and that it would be the most encouraging thing that we've ever heard. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So what we're going to do, we're going to be looking at why we struggle to believe this. Oh, and by the way, I, I want to say I recognize in your cars you might be getting a bit toasty. May every drop of sweat be an offering to the glory of God this morning. All right? You have not yet suffered to the point of shedding blood. You have not yet sweat blood. If you do, please let us know. We will get you help. All right? But, but just know I recognize it's hot out there. Uh, also, if you need to start your car to keep your, your battery uh, charged up, please do that. All right? Feel free to do that. All right. Reasons that you and I struggle, reasons that believers struggle to really take to heart Romans 8, 28. First of all, I think the first reason is this. It's based on what we don't know. In other words, um, we have conflicting thoughts, conflicting experiences. We know the verse starts with. I mean, that's how it starts. We know this. Not we have a hunch, not we, we, we think this could be true, but we know it. There's a certainty, a confidence. But here's the conf conflictedness of it all. What we don't know eclipses what we do know. And what, what do I mean by that? You know, it, it just said in, in verse 26, we don't know how to pray. Now what he's talking about there. He said, we are hurting so badly. We are speechless. We don't even know how to express our hurt. And that inability, that not knowing, it, it rails against our knowing that God is working for our good. We're conflicted. What we don't know how to do that this, this inability to express our pain, it fights against what we do know in Christ. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones put it this way. He said, he can be certain about the ultimate when he is most uncertain about the immediate. When our experience goes counter to our hope. In other words, I, I don't know, but I do know. We're conflicted. And that makes it hard when what we see, when what we experience is counter to what we know in the Word of God. It makes it difficult. The point is, this morning, two things can be true at the same time. We can be hurting so badly that we don't even know how to express it. And we can know that he is working 
the bad out for our good. I want you to notice what Paul didn't say. Paul didn't say we feel. He didn't say we sense. He didn't say we have a hunch that God is working for our good. Let's be very real here or it's not going to be encouraging. It may feel like you're all alone, like God is cruel, like God is unjust, like God is distant, like God has forsaken you. It may feel that way. Some of that is because God's ways are just so much higher than ours, we don't get it. We just, we don't get it. It may be because, because God's, God's good is so much greater and higher than, than, than the way we view good. We just don't get it. Maybe because God's toolbox is so much more diverse than we can imagine. This verse soothes the soul when we rely on what we know from him. It says, and we know. Do you know God is at work for the good of his children? Do you know it? Well, let me, let me answer this because your question is probably, well, how did Paul know it? How did he know it? How did he come to that knowledge? Well, this, this, is, this is key because it was not by experience. Because Paul, when he wrote this, had not yet been glorified. He, he had not reached, he says, I have not yet attained it. And, and so what he's talking about, this good that he's talking about, is not something he had fully experienced. I mean, yes, I, he certainly had tastes of that final ultimate good. He had present steps toward that final Holiness and sanctification and reward. Yes, I, I think he saw it to be how God works in general. Using even trials for his ultimate purpose. I mean, certainly that was the story of Joseph. What, when he said to his brothers, what you guys meant for evil. Throwing me in a pit, selling me to some foreigners. It led to me being a, 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 a in jail and and, but what you did for evil, God meant for good. I mean, certainly Paul knew the word; he knew that was God's norm. But Paul's knowing this truth, along with other believers, is a confident, faith-given hope based on the promises. Of God. Second Peter 1 4 says this He has given us very great and precious promises, so that through them you may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in this world. That corruption that makes all creation groan. These great promises. So we can escape that. Promises like he gave to Eve when in Genesis 3 he said, Your seed, Eve, your offspring will crush the serpent's head. In other words, I'm promising Eve, I'm bringing good. I'm going to destroy evil. Promises like Abraham, through your offspring, oh, you will be a blessing, a blessing, a rich treasure chest of good things to all nations. Promise of good. Promise to David on the Davidic throne will sit one forever who will judge how? Justly, justly. John 
14, 2, Jesus himself said, I'm going away. Oh, but I'm making a place for you so I can come again and take you unto myself. I'm making a place for you, a place in the new heaven and new earth, a place that's going to be incredible. A promise. First, John three, two, John says, dear friends, we are God's children now. That means right now you're already a child of God. How good is that? And what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know. This is John saying it as well. We know that when he appears, Jesus appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. Revelation 21, 4. It says that a voice from the throne said, now who might that be, right? A voice from the throne said, oh, he's going to wipe away every tear from their eyes death will no longer exist grief crying and pain will no will exist no longer why because the previous things have passed away promise revelation 2 7 he says i christ speaking i will give the victor the right to eat from the tree of life which is in god's paradise and then in first peter 3 13 peter says this so based on his promise we wait for the new heavens and the new earth where righteousness will dwell where goodness will be goodness alone justice love glory of the new heaven and new earth and so we wait based on the promise see paul is clear he's clear what he is claiming to know it it, it is while it is for this life somewhat i mean the calling of god the justification the sanctification those things are part of this life but ultimately it's so much more What Paul knows and hopes for is heavenly glory. It's what he's been leading up to in chapter 8. He's been talking about glory, this coming glory. How our trials in this life don't hold a candle to the glory, the, the glorious goodness that's coming. It's coming. This final restoration, this ultimate perfection, a new heaven and earth. And that knowing about what's coming changes the way Paul endured in this life. It also changed the way Jesus endured because Hebrews 12 says it is for the joy set before him. And yes, I think he had a better glimpse of what it was. I think he had a better knowledge of what it was. But he's given us some of that knowledge in the word. But for the glory set before him, what did Christ do? He endured the cross. He thought little of the shame so paul's hopeful knowing is not merely about this earthly circumstance in fact he he says in to the corinthian church if we have put our hope in christ for this life only then we should be pitied more than anyone paul's knowing is the deep spiritual confidence In the promise of God to finish what he started. Yes, I I think Paul's knowing may, may have been supported, corroborated in what he sees the Spirit doing in him in the here and now. He sees that, he tastes it, yeah, it's but his certainty that God will finish it is by faith in who his father is. We sang this morning. Oh, he's a good, good father. That is who he is. And we're loved by him. Paul's certainty is that God will finish it by faith in who he is. Paul's certainty is by faith in what Christ meant when he said, it is finished. He believes it. 
Paul's knowing is by faith that one, the one who is being offer, offered by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are in the here and now being sanctified. It's sure and certain. Paul's knowing is by faith that Jesus has been given a gloriously good kingdom and Paul has been given citizenship in it. Paul's knowing is by faith that what is unseen is more sure than what is seen. Knowing as Paul knows this truth is the most certain of all ways to know. Because knowing based on God's self-disclosure, God's revelation of himself in the word, that kind of knowing, it, it isn't figured out by our sleuthing, our, our finite sleuthing. It isn't figured out um, by, according to our own mental abilities. It isn't biased by our own prejudice or our, our biases. It is what God has said, this is true. Our knowing is sure and certain because it's based on the very knowing of God himself. And it's also sure because of who, whom it's about. It's about God. And it's sure and certain. Why? Because God doesn't change. We can know that what we know today about God by his self-revelation and his word, it's going to be true tomorrow and the next day and the next day. I mean, you watch our scientists, right? Their knowledge is not by divine revelation. It's by investigation. That's good. It's good discipline. But it is flawed. It's flawed by human knowing Of all the kinds of knowing that there are. This kind of knowing when Paul says we know. It is the most certain and sure. Because it is grounded in the very knowing of God. And God won't change. So. Whatever Paul knows. Whatever it is that he knows. Based on what he hears. Uh, maybe it's the accusations of the Corinthian church. Whatever Paul knows based on what he sees, maybe it's the, the persecutions from the, the Roman emperor, whatever it is that Paul knows based on how he feels, all of that knowing, based on his experience, all of that knowing, it is colored and shaped and informed by his hopeful, faithful, confident, certain, trustful, holding to what he knows without wavering. Why? He who has promised is faithful. And he knows it, to be sure. I pray that you and I would know like Paul knew. We would know with that kind of faithful certainty who God is and how God is at work in every situation and circumstance, good as well as bad, for our, our, our end ultimate good. And, and that this knowing based on the promises and character of God would be that cordial to your soul, to the soul that's ready to faint from whatever else it is that you're experiencing. Paul starts out this verse, and we know. I think we struggle to believe this because we forget how it is that we know and we rely on things that we know from ways that are fallible. And Paul says, no. Make sure your knowing is based on what God knows. It's infallible. Hang on one second. All right. I'm looking for 
my telephone. We don't call it a telephone anymore, do we? Because on my telephone is a clock. Um, if I could have somebody back there bring me, look for my phone and bring it to me, all right? That way these folks will get to eat lunch today. Thank you, 1147. We'll do point two, all right? And then, and then we'll take the rest in coming weeks. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. All right. I'm supposed to have that up there before I start. The second reason, church, that we struggle to believe this verse is that it's based on what we don't see. First, it was what we, what we don't know. We don't know how to pray. We don't know how to deal with it. We don't know why this is happening. And all these things, these experiences are counter to what, what God says. But, but also, it's what we don't see. We are short-sighted and overly focused. Those two things were short-sighted and we're overly focused on the wrong thing. And I get this from the text where it says we, 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 God works together all things. He works them together for our glorious good. This word works together. It, it, it's a Greek word that's a compound word to work and together. It, he, he combines those things together. And here's the thing, we, we don't, and I would even say we can't, see the purpose when we're looking at each individual part, each individual difficulty, each individual hardship. We, we can't see the whole thing, how it's going to come together. We don't have that kind of sight, we're too short-sighted. When I buy a, a kit that says assembly required, besides, it making, besides making me a little giddy, I like to put stuff together. I don't always know what each part is for at first glance. I don't know how it's going to go into the hole. But once assembled, then I understand each part's contribution to the functioning of the whole. Seemingly worthless washers become incredibly important. You see... We can't see the whole church. We can't see how everything is going to be worked together. We don't see the end from the beginning. I often refer to Hebrews 2.8. We don't yet see everything subject to Jesus. He says everything is subject to Jesus. It has been subjected to him. Put under his dominion. Under his power. We don't yet see is what the writer of Hebrews tells us. We don't see how everything is under his control. We see how through a glass dimly. Through a dirty windshield is how we see. So we can't see how each piece of the puzzle of life fits. We've got dark pieces. We've got light pieces. We've got medium pieces. But one day, God's going to stand back after putting the puzzle completely together and he's going to see what he's put together and he's going to say, that is very good. That is good exceedingly. Just like he did when he created the world and he stepped back and he said, now that is good. As God makes good things and we are his workmanship. Ephesians 2.10. But you see, not only is our, our sight limited, it's usually ultra-focused, laser-precise. And it's, look, it's natural. When we get hurt, when, I, when I, we get a splinter, or, or I, I, when I smash a finger, or when I'm, I'm burning a pile of stuff and a coal falls down in the glove, and I, I, I don't wonder if my shoes and socks are, you know, if I put the, the matching pair on. I'm focused on that because it hurts with, with incredible focus, right? When we're grieving, all focus goes to the loss. And, and, and it's not something we should feel guilty for. I think it's there, you know, physically we have nerves to, to, to tell us something's wrong. And spiritually, I think it's right to say something's wrong, and we focus on it to fix it, or at least to say, here it is, God, I cast my cares to you. It's difficult to accept that God is working all things for our good when we can't 
see how it fits together and we can't seem to get our focus off the hurt. And so we remember what we know based on God's knowing that God is not working to make every individual circumstance good. That's not the confession here. He is working all of our circumstances, the the difficult and the joyful for our good ultimately. And this shapes our praying or it ought to. We ought to be praying, Lord, give me faith to lean into what I can't yet see with my eyes. Those good things promised. Help me trust that you have good plans for this bad time. Lord, focus my eyes on Jesus and off the hurt. Help me believe I don't have to completely and perfectly tend that he is the great physician. And if I focus on him, he will attend to my hurts. He will heal. Lord, let me not ever, and I think this is key, let me not ever base my joy today on just one thing. Lord, don't ever let me base my my pain, my, my discouragement today on just one thing since you are working all things together for my good. When this verse is hard to swallow, church, that we know God's working for our good, our ultimate good, our heavenly good, our holiness, Don't let what you don't know, don't let, don't let what you know by human experience alone distract you from what you do know according to the word of God, his promises, which is that good is coming. Wait for it, wait for it. And don't judge your good based on just one single event because God works all things together for good. I hope this is an encouragement for you. And we'll pick up next week on some of the other reasons it's difficult for us. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you that your word is such encouragement to us. Father, I pray that we would know based on your knowing and we would trust and look toward how you're going to bring the dark pieces of life together with the brighter pieces into this final masterpiece And together, it's going to be so very good. Father, I pray for those who are in the the depths, the valley of the shadow of death, even this morning. That you would help their knowing. That you would give them sight eyes of faith to see your goodness to see that you're not sleeping but you're working everything everything for our glorious and final good father if there is any this morning who has been trusting their own righteousness to make them good in your eyes that this morning they will stop that by your spirit and they will start trusting Jesus to be the only thing, their only hope ever of being good 
in your eyes. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.